We were in the green room preparing, and um, Cece wrote this little word. I'm just going to not even have her come read it because it went so along with what's on my heart today. Um, Yeah, let's just start there. She said, my prophets lead, my prophets speak, but do you trust me to lead? There's a flow of where these words will go. Do you surrender to the flow or take hold of my words as a tool of your own? Prophecy is meant to provoke reverence first and foremost. Surrender is required to benefit from what has been poured out. For the pouring is but an invitation to what is flowing. Love that line. Your mental understanding of what is released should never be in the lead. Oh, God, help us. You can still go ahead and say that. Oh, God, help me. <laughs> Sorry for y'all. It's weird coming into a prophetic house as opposed to the pastor-led house, I know. I feel, I feel compassion for you, okay, a little bit. <laughs> you aren't called to carve out the river ahead. I love that line. Yeah. Of the word, for every drop wetting your whistle is to turn your attention to the waters already surging. Your mental gymnastics erect only walls. They imprison you and block your view. Open the blinds, release your mind. You must revere the seed giver before harvesting the fruit. Another really good line. Trust in the flow and which way I go. Surrender to my ascension and in my footsteps you will follow. I love that. I'm, I've got about another 10 titles I didn't have time to make slides for you today because I was celebrating Lynn and might I say we saw a movie that had to do with resurrection from Marvel how who would have ever dreamed anyway it was kind of fun but I think I would entitle today beyond the door I did make a little slide for that but I don't know yet but um did it do something fun Sweet. Who who was a whistle? When I when I was just a child. <laughs> I feel like that should be in song form. And we don't even really like musicals, do we? Easy, no judging. I get to not like them. I was um Introduced to the prophetic when I was a wee little tot. My, um, I grew up in my grandpa's church till I was 11 years old in Norman, America. Joel Steen's dad used to come and preach revivals at our church in Norman. And my mom's claim to fame is she made Joel Osteen's dad a roast. <laughs> We're still making that roast today. I mean, think that's a, that's a 80 year old roast <laughs> recipe or how it rolled. But when we moved to this church in downtown Oklahoma City called Bethel, when I was 11, we started going there. And we would have camp meetings. Anybody ever been to a camp meeting? And the Holy Spirit would come. I was filled with the Spirit when I was 11. That was in the 70s, if you want to do the math. And everything changed for me that day. I remember it distinctly. But there was, we, hadn't, we didn't understand what all was going on. I mean, of course we didn't. We don't now. Isn't it weird to know that what you know now is going to be obsolete? Like what I knew when I was 11 is so obsolete right now in this moment. 
that I'm just like, why am I even bringing it up? But I want to show you a contrast. And so my dad would get up and the spirit of the Lord would come upon him. I could tell because it happens to me, it happens to bro, his voice tone would change and we we can't stop it. Like, I don't know if you can hear it when something falls on Aaron, the tone of his voice changes. And when it first started happening to him, he's like, he was asking me, what's happening? I was like, man, you just got to go with it. Like, you can't even worry about what you sound like. Excuse me. And so my dad would get up and he'd walk the aisles and he would prophesy much like an Old Testament prophet would. Because that's all we knew. Which, do you know what that means? Let me explain the Old Testament prophets were pointing out the severity of distance, distancing ourselves from God. If you understand the Bible as a whole, the Old Testament proved our utter need for Jesus. And in God's amazing plan, Jesus became not a figurative door, but a literal door that when I, to pass through this door, I have to surrender all. Listen, you can hover, and some of us have and did for years, at the door of Jesus, believing in Him, desiring Him, wanting Him. But there will come a day when you surrender all and you pass through the doorway. And when you pass through the doorway, everything that would separate you from the Father is turned into something else. That is that is amazing. You don't even know what a gift that is, what a privilege, what an honor, just that you believe that. Did you know there's people today that stand in the outer wishing they could get over themselves yes. to come in to the inner? Yes. But baby, just get in the inner. Yes. Don't worry about yes. everybody on the outer. Just get on in. And as I watched my dad years later, there, there was another person I would say who was a prophetic influence in my life. They were influencers. <laughs> but what ended up happening to me is that what I saw, I didn't want to look like. And so there was this brief moment in time in my life where I said, I'm not going to have anything to do with the prophetic because it's pathetic. 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 The prophetic is pathetic. But in that moment, I had an encounter with God. Thank the Lord. Thank where I would be today. Sometimes I think about it. Where I would be if I let that modeling determine my gifting. Yeah. Because see, in that moment, God was showing me why the prophetic needed an, a, 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 sorry, an apostolic covering. Yeah. We didn't have it then. A little church in Bethel, 7th and Blackwater, they had no apostolic covering. They just had a pastor. And I don't know if you understand this, but a pastor can't wrangle in a, prof a prophet. Yes. Way too wily. I could tell you how much stories about that too. Let's don't do that. And so I have this history where I woke up one day and I said, Oh, you've called me to fix that problem. Every single one of you in here, you have that same thing. All those things that offended you or that you said, I'm never going to be a part of or I'm not going to do it that way. or He's saying, mm, you're going to fix that problem. That one you hate. That one, it's not right. It's not right and you can see it for a reason. And so I had to learn how to be diplomatic with prophets. 
because they're weird. <laughs> Prophets are weird from, from my perspective. I don't consider myself a prophet. I consider myself apostolic. I can see why you're weird. You know, Tessa sent me the weirdest dream I think I've ever known. <laughs> and in the dream, she said, I was just narrating what was going on, just like this right here. Just, well, that crazy thing's happening, and that crazy <laughs> thing's happening, that crazy thing's happening. I don't know how many bunch of y'all dreamed about me this week. But see, in that moment that I made that discovery, I had no idea how to do me. I became less of an enigma that day. How many ever just felt like you just, who, who in the heck are you? What? Why? Did? What? That? How many have ever felt that? Beautiful. The orchestrator of time knew you'd be sitting in this room today. You know, my, my little prodigy over here, Bubba Gump Shrimp. <laughs> you know, it was one year ago this week that he arrived long-haired like Jesus. <laughs> and Shudy told me today that she had on those very pants. Who, know, who remembers that? I wouldn't even been able to tell you it was February when he came. <laughs> See, I know how many years I prayed for him before he ever knew my name. Why? Because it's his time. It's not about the crapola from before. It's about now. This orchestrator of time says now. Now is your moment because, see, I had a now moment. You know, when I, I remember where I was when I was thinking, I don't have anything to do with the prophetic. And God said, thank you. In that moment, he said, thank you, because I want you to pioneer something. See, let me help you. Your leadership ability is not gender oriented. It's gift oriented. <laughs> I don't have time to preach on it today, but that's why the pastor-led church messed up everybody with men just being in charge of everything because then God stuck leadership in women. He didn't. Men have leadership too. I'm just saying it's not. it has nothing to do. In, in Jesus, there's no male or female. There's no Jew or Greek. There's no nationality. We don't need to stand on the side of all of these movements and try to get everybody to think something matters. Because for God, it all matters. The holder of time says it matters that you're here. It matters that you... Get shiny. And you know, the funny thing is, is that the shining process, this process of iron sharpening iron, of the process of how humanity needs to interact with God and humans to actually rub off all of the stuff that we're mad at that didn't work out. We're mad that our parents didn't do well. Come on, it's just good to admit it. And so God says, just like he said to me, when I realized I didn't want to do the prophetic that way, that became the door to pioneering something. As long as I stood over here on the side and said, shouldn't have been that way. They shouldn't have done it that way. Pointing out, how many know that prophetic people, they just point out all the stuff that's wrong everywhere. Listen, they get you nowhere. It's only the ability to see. In this little stupid movie yesterday, it was so great because it said, the moment you step into taking responsibility, you can see things you could have never seen before. And see, I said that day, I will gather the prophets. 
I will train them that their weirdness sustains me. <laughs> Some guy from Hawaii said that to me in Colorado one time to us. Your weirdness sustains me. At that moment, I'm not even for sure that I knew we were weird. <laughs> so Pam's <laughs> like, no. so I didn't know what I was doing that sustained him. But I see it now. And see, when you step into that, I love, let me read you a couple. Of scriptures. I have a lot. Hebrews 9, 2 Timothy 3, 1 Peter 1 again, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 1, and Hebrews 12. So if I don't get to all those, then y'all can do it, right? Yeah. What was I going to read right now? I was? Are you sure? I don't think that was. First Peter 1 says, so prepare your hearts and minds for action. Just think about that for a minute. Which one of those things needs more preparing for you? Some of y'all's hearts are super willing, but your mind is filled with chaos from the past. Some of you, your heart is kind of aloof. You're like, that's cool. And then your mind's messed up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Remember what that, I like the passion. He says, fasten your seatbelt. Roll up your sleeves. Stay alert. Fix your hope firmly on the marvelous grace that's coming to you. See, when I step through this proverbial door of Jesus, not only did the grace pull me in, but grace then saturates me completely yeah. the power to change the power listen i'm resurrected how how do we not know this how do we not talk about this everybody's talking about it now i'm resurrected the moment i've surrendered i come into jesus i am resurrected in that moment in this movie it was so good wasn't it yeah. this girl literally fell into the water and was resurrected it's, it's weird how there's displays even in the world. I, mean, I am sure no one at Sony knew why they dunked that girl two times. But I could see it. It was just right there. It was so clear. It's a mirror of what the supernatural is doing in people's lives. If you can see it, it's all metaphor. And so this grace, it's... It's marvelous, it's what it says, but it's it's so enough. The supernatural word satisfactory. It satisfies all of the stuff I can't get over. It's the power to leap over the things of my past that still try to come against me, that still try to infiltrate my mind to try to convince me I just need to do something else. This is too hard, whatever. It says, for when Jesus Christ is unveiled, a greater measure of grace is released to you. What makes Jesus unveiled to you? You know, it says that in, remember why, what is this a metaphor of? It's a metaphor of what Moses had to do. Why did Moses have to do it? Because when he rescued them out of, out of Egypt, it's a metaphor for your life. When you were rescued out of Egypt, did you come to the mountain to worship him? Or did you come to the mountain to let someone be in between you and God? If I stick something in between me and God... I have to create a bunch of laws to hold me morally sound. That's why the fabric of morality is shift, has shifted in the world. 
Like I said Wednesday night, things we had never dreamed of people would do. They're doing them openly. To reveal to us what? That's what it, that's why God says, I hate lukewarm. Lukewarm is in secret. He likes for it. We don't have to be afraid if we're post resurrected. He's not trying to reveal something bad, scary, yucky about me. He's trying to reveal my purpose. He's trying to reveal my identity. He's trying to reveal the rewardable activities. He's trying to reveal my gifts. He's trying to reveal why I'm here. But see, I'm on the other side of the door. I'm afraid of judgment. When I hear the word judgment, Tessa wrote me a word during worship about judgment. I didn't let her give it because we're scared of that word judgment. We are. We don't realize that post-resurrection, I need the judgment of God to make me shiny. Yeah. I need, that's the scripture I was going to read. Let's read it. It's one bad thing about being electronic. You are rising, Ephesians 2. You are rising like the perfectly fitted stones of the temple, and your lives have been built up together upon the foundation laid by the, the apostles and prophets. Yes. Best of all, you're connected to the head cornerstone of the building, the anointed one, Jesus Christ himself. This entire building, what's that building? The ecclesia. Yeah. You're perfectly fitted this entire building is under construction. So if you're in the Ecclesia, you're under construction. And it's continually growing under his supervision until it rises up, completed as the holy temple of the Lord himself. This means that God is transforming each one of you into the holy of holies, his dwelling place through the power of the Holy Spirit living in you. So what's that's his objective right there. When Moses gave... When God told Moses to build this um, way for the sins of the people to be satisfied with God, why is that necessary? Because I have a conscience. I talked about that a few weeks ago. And so that needed to be satisfied for me to live as if I've never sinned. So he made a way so they would bring all their sins one time a year. And what would happen? The priest would go and remember what they did when they went into the holy holes. They they tied a rope around his leg. Oh man, <laughs> think about that for a minute. I'm the guy. If he if you heard him go, and they just pulled him out by the rope because it was too much. Jesus satisfied all that. You don't need to tie a rope around your leg anymore. All of that was just the display of how much we needed Jesus. Yes. But Jesus satisfies all of that and says the Holy Spirit's intention is to make you the holy of holies. Yes. What? We don't even know what that means. It means that God dwells in me, around me, among me. There's not a man between me and God anymore. The door allow me to step into placement. Placement matters. You know, when you read the stories of Jesus' last moments, John, he, you know, if you go to the, I think it's the last chapter of John, he literally says, The disciple that Jesus loved. That's what he says about himself. The one that runs fast. He literally says that the last thing he wants us to remember was Peter was tattletelling on him. Wanting to know, what about that guy? Oh gosh, let's read it for fun. It's a fun, it's a fun one. John 21, it says Jesus appeared once again with a group of his disciples by Lake Galilee. It happened that that day there's Peter Thomas, the twin, Nathaniel, Jacob, John, and two other disciples he didn't want to name. 
I guess that was too many to name here. Peter told them, I'm going fishing. Oh, dang. It literally says right here, Jesus had appeared to them three times after he was resurrected, and now they're going back to their old jobs. Just this little group of guys. Couldn't hang on to it. And they, he said, I'm going fishing, Mr. Leader. And they all said, we'll go with you. So they fished all night long. How many of us do this? God calls us out of something and says, I want you to do this other thing. I just want you to attend church. That's a big one. That's that one pound weight. I just want you to show up to church. That's the one pound weight in the supernatural. We all want training. We all want to be these cool, spiritual, I can see stuff, but we don't want to get training very often because it causes us to be corrected. Come on, let's just be honest. And see, that leadership ability in us, it'll cause us to go back to doing other things that we're familiar with. The familiar always beckons. Even if it's just in our heads. Have you ever had a dream when you're a teenager that you're going to, i got people in here are going to be the next Mariah Carey, going to be the next Deion Sanders, we have, right? Is this why? They're projected out there as something marvelous. Right? I was born then. No one was wanting to be Teresa Rogers. <laughs> why? Because I wasn't famous. Our nature is drawn. Right? And how many of us became Deion Sanders and Mariah Carey, no one in here, right? Because you were meant to be something else, you. To God, your whatever that thing is that you have in your head, that's who you are to God. See, when I realized that about myself, you know, those famous things project a fantasy reality that I measure myself to inadvertently. And so then what are we? We have less than. We always have less than. We always missed it. We always, somebody, how many know somebody stepped in and kept you from doing that dream? How many know that? That was God. Thank, say thank you, God, right now because He saved your life. You've been blaming them, but they saved your literal life. Because you were going. You weren't asking. You were going. You were doing it. And some stepped in and said, Boop. and you're like, man, how many were mad at them for years? You didn't even know it was God. You thought they made you miss the train. <laughs> so that's that. here they are. They're going back to their old life. It says Jesus standing on the shore says, Hey, did y'all catch anything? He knew the answer. <laughs> Listen, every question you have is from God. Bye. Every question you have is from God. Every question. Why? He has an answer. If you got a question, Jesus is asking it. He's on the shore of your proverbial dream. Yes. Your life. Yes. And he's like, hey. Yes. Did you catch anything? I think this is the funniest story ever. And they're like, no. It said they had been up all night. So he said, throw your net on the other side. Do you know what a little boat is? Like the water here and the water here on a little boat, it's no different. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. That's it. Listen, you may have been in ministry. You may be thinking you're in the water. <laughs> Easy move. The water's the same, but it's when he says. Throw it over to the other side. Move over to this other thing. Thank you. Got a golf clap in the back. 
they caught so many. And then it says this. Here's John. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said, Peter, it's the Lord. <laughs> Clearly, John was an introvert. And when Peter heard him say that, because what was Peter doing? Fishing. Took an introvert to point it out. Um, he dove right into the lake, stripped down to nothing, dove into the lake like an idiot. The other disciples brought the boat to shore, you know, got other fish, blah, 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 did all that. This is what's funny to me. Let's go down 13. Jesus came close to them, verse 13, served them bread and, and fish. Jesus was already cooking up a fish dinner. Yes. Wow. And it says, this was the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples after the resurrection. And he said to Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you burn with love for me more than these? Peter said, yes, you know, I have great affection for you. And he said, take care of my lambs. And he repeated the question, Simon, son of Jonah, do you burn with love for me? And he said, Lord, you know, I have great affection for you. He said, take care of my sheep. And Jesus asked him again, Peter, son of Jonah, do you have great affection for me? And Peter was sad because he was asked three times. And he said, my Lord, you know everything. You know I burn with love for you. And Jesus said, then feed my lambs. He said, when you were younger, you made choices of your own. You went where you, were, where you pleased. But one day, when you're old, others will tie you up and escort you where you would not choose to go, and you'll spend, spread out your arms. Jesus said this to Peter as a prophecy of what kind of death he would die. And then, G and then he said, Peter, follow me. See, what Jesus was doing was, I believe personally that Jesus was letting people, Peter have an experience of what it's like for him to keep asking are you going to keep choosing me? He had just asked him three, that he had just come to them three times. A lot of people say this is the restoration of Peter because of the three times he's denied him, but I don't believe that. I believe he had already come, he had already showed himself three times to them, and then Peter still picked fishing. Listen, this is such a good, if you could get, if you can be with me on. So he's what's what's happening is he's saying, I saw you. In the upper room, I showed you, but you still came and fished. I saw you out in the courtyard, and you saw my hands, but you still came and you fished. I saw you when you're out in the boat fishing, and I said, do you see the love of the Father right there? He's saying, you can't go back to fishing, bud. You've already been wrecked by my love. And the way you stay, see, I'm all into longevity. See, I can do this for 10 years, 20 years, but I want to do it a lifetime. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I am not afraid I will walk away from God because I will constantly be burning with love for Him. I will constantly be feeding the things that are most important to Him, which are lambs. Which are What are lambs? Lambs are little. Some of you are a baby. Some of you are... 80 years old and you're still baby Christians. Nobody's in your 80, so I was able to not offend anyone. <laughs> and some of you are lambs, you're a little bit older, and some of you are sheep. See, that's all the age groups that we go through. And he's saying, please, don't abort the lambs or the sheep or anybody else to go back to your old life because now that you've encountered me, you have a completely different destiny. All you got from your father and mother was, was to be a fisherman. So you got something from your father and mother. It may have been a zero. It may have been a big fat rock piece of coal. But we created a dream out of that nothing. But is that really his dream? Or are you just fishing? Just because you know how. 
See, to pioneer something, I know. There's not a bunch of people around me going, wow, you can train prophetic people. You can do it. No one came to me and said that, but I had an encounter with the one. See, I've been offered to coach collegiate ball. I've been offered to do a lot of other things. But when he came and encountered me, he said, will you feed my sheep? Will you train these people that you sat under for years and years and years and no one ever trained them? Would you solve the problem? Will you solve it? And see, that's what creates this thing in me like, oh my gosh, we're all in this building process. So when I say we could expand, it's not for me. It's not so I can just do something. It's for the ability for us to actually influence the things that you're to pioneer. You like a pioneer because you're meant to pioneer. You don't even know how. Most of us are scared of it. You know, most everybody I've ever met, they say, well, what book is that in? Give me a book to read. Is there a book on that? Is there a Dr. Google on that? I used to say this. You can ask Lynn and Pammy. I used to say this for years. When I first met them, you're meant to write the book. You're meant to write the book. I know it's little, but we're working on our third book right now. Why? Because we're meant to write the book. So what... What has messed you up in your life? What has made you go, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know? If you just turn your affection and say, if he was sitting before me tonight, right now and he said, do you love me? What would I say? Sure, I love you. <laughs> he said, this is the way he's saying, we'll do what I would do if I was here. That's all he's saying. Do what I would do. What would Jesus do if he was here? You're him now. When he says, do you love me? It's, he's not asking you, do you love him? He's asking you, do you love him more than doing your thing? Yeah. Than doing what you're comfortable with? Yeah. Than doing what you're used to doing? Than doing that old thing? You know, I have to talk to Cece like this a lot. You know, she's really smart. She has a degree. She could have been a chemist. I don't know if y'all understand this, but I'm about as far from a chemist as you can ever <laughs> dream of in your lifetime. Like my last time to take science was in the seventh grade, and I think I cheated because I didn't know anything that was going on. <laughs> the moment we had to touch those frogs, I was like, this is not anything, any, none of this is for me. I had my worst injury in school in science class. See, it just all pointed to know science for Tisa. <laughs> and so when I met Cece, I, I was intimidated by her brain, how smart it is. Like, she can remember stuff y'all can't believe. Like, this is just, she shares with you one one thousandth of what's in her head. It's crazy. She's deep. Yes. And I was deep, but she was deeper in a different way. And so... There was this moment of intimidation when I, I saw her the way he saw her. And I said, I don't even know that I can. I don't even know if I can train something that smart because I don't feel that smart. But see, it wasn't about me. He just said, do you love me? I remember he said to me, she's gone as far as she can go without somebody taking her under their wing. And I, I just kept hearing him say, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? You know, I sat in a room full of prophetic people that I know are way more gifted than me. But I don't ask myself. I can't get over there next to their gifting and compare. I would be consumed. 
but I just breathe on how much he loves them. When I see something, I called Aaron the other day and I was like, hey, you need to readjust this little area of your life. Well, there's not, I don't get any joy in that. I'm shaking as I refine him because I have so much love for him. I wouldn't want him to get one mark. So y'all don't know, I, I'm watching over, I'm sending out Pams and Lennies and all kinds of people to what? To figure out where you are, how you're doing. Because why? Because he just keeps saying, do you love me? Do you love me? Then do what I would do. Do you love me? Listen, he's asking you that today. Do you love me? Then do what he would do. Don't do what you would do. Don't go fishing, please. Because you're not going to catch anything. And he might not be at the shore with a fish dinner. He would be, but you get my point. Because why? He's constructing something with your life. It's your time. This is your time. This is your time. I can't say it enough. He's pouring out his spirit. He's brought us into the understanding. I have an understanding of how to train prophetic people. I don't know where I got it. No one came and gave me this book. I just had this download because he just said, do you love me? You look way better refined than you do fishing. Come on. And just think of all the people. You know, I had a little guy wanting counseling this week and just a young little whippersnapper. And I I asked Aaron and Vinton, I said, I said, I didn't tell them much about him. I just said, let, just, I, just let God love you, love him through you. You know, later, I think Tessa told me Vinton even had a dream about him, but what happened? I love the comment. He said, I didn't really expect anything when I came. <laughs> Some men with those great big expectations. <laughs> but he said, but I... I'm leaving, I feel like a million dollars. Why? He's just saying, do you love me? Do you love me? Then do what I would do. Build what I would build. Pioneer what I would pioneer. I know it doesn't exist, and I know you wish you could just snuggle your little feathers up underneath something but you're meant to pioneer. You're meant to be trained. You're meant to be equipped. You're meant to be refined. And you've got to get underneath where the refining can happen. We can all go rogue. Y'all have all been rogue. Every prophet I've ever met has been rogue. Everybody can do that. That didn't take nothing. It takes a ton for you to reach out and say, I don't know about this decision. I'll help you clean up your mess, but wouldn't it be great if we quit making them? Wouldn't it? A simple phone call will do. Hey, I'm thinking about running my life for the next three years. (laughs) How do you feel about this decision? But see, prophets don't want to do that. See, the Old Testament prophets stood and delivered the judgment of God. The New Testament prophets, Jesus saying, do you love me? then you have to work every word I give you into encouragement. Everything you think you see, everything you think you feel, everything has to go through the doorway of encouragement. It cannot come out of your mouth unless it's encouragement. And that takes a lot, I know. Most of the stuff I hear is in choleric language. Because I'd be choleric. Why would he talk to me in phlegmatic language? I would slap that out of my head. (laughs) That's why it's good to know what personality you are, to know what kind, how God talks. And He's usually really direct. I would love sometimes to just tell you how I hear it. It's not near as nice. It's more direct. But see, I had to learn, this is what's crazy, is that God shows me what personality I'm talking to. I don't know, I think at the encounter room they had a friend come. What was her name? Misty, yeah, 
Yeah. God showed me what kind of personality she was before I gave her the word. Why? Because I had to say it in the way she could receive it. And see, that just takes that just takes time to learn that. But the whole time that I'm like, well, why do I have to do it that way? I told him that for a while. Well, why do I have to do it that way? I mean, the same message will get across. And he was like, no. Do you love me? Do you love me? You have to do it my way. That's what he was saying to Peter. You used to do whatever the heck you wanted to. When you're old, you're gonna people are gonna lead you around. But right now, you're not the, either one of those places. And that's what he's saying to us today. Nobody in here is in either one of those places. And he's saying, "I'm building something." But the question is, do you love me? Everything's provided on the other side of this door. But do you love me? Come on, Cece. Aren't you so glad <laughs> that Tisa loves Jesus? I mean, that's the simplest thing we could celebrate and say thank you for. Thank you so much, Tisa. Let's just all stand up and just give her a round of applause and express our gratitude for her love for Jesus. Not because of every little thing, but because she loves Jesus. That's the anchor for everything that she does. She loves him so well. She loves him so well. For You know, this month our focus is love. Make your love a verb. And that's her life. Love is a verb. It's, the, it's what she breathes in and out, inhales and exhales, is love. Everything she does is because she loves Jesus. And we are all the benefactors of that. So thank you, Tisa. Never stop loving him with your incredible passion and commitment and devotion. It saves our lives. You know, um, I had a dream last night that um, I didn't couldn't remember very many details about it, but um, it basically was that there there's an order to things. You could say there was a first step and a second step. There was a phase one and a phase two, and somebody was telling me that people were doing them in the wrong order, and that explained the condition of things. People were doing this phase two before phase one, step two before phase one. Now, that was very generic, I mean, general. You know, I didn't know what that, what we were referring to. And um, Tisa already read that little prophetic word that I had from him earlier. Um, just while I was in the green room, um, I started to hear him speaking on that about how uh, I think it was saying more than one thing, but basically the prophetic is an invitation to what he's speaking and to what he's doing into a flow that he's doing. We, we don't aren't meant to take that in our hands as a tool to wield by ourselves. And so that's a big, uh, I think, a tendency for us, especially, you know, we've poured out a, a lot of prophetic words and um, this year just being the beginning of the year and the word of the year. And there's a lot of instruction that comes through that and training. And he's doing a lot. And we love that. We love that. But I felt like this was just him saying that we can't get that out of order because it's essentially the same thing that Tisa talked about today. It's going back to fishing with the word he gave us instead of following him, instead of doing what he said, even if we can't see how to get to what he said from where he's led us. You know, there there's a, a, a sensation that you can have. I had that myself the other day with the word about tuberculosis, and I found myself in the days following. I'm like, well, I know this applies to me in this particular area, but I can't figure out how to get there. You know, and that's just I have to trust him. We have to trust him in the process of what he's doing. And so that applies to a lot of things. But I think we have to have our love for him be the leader in all that we do. Just like Tisa is extremely wise, too. She was talking about my my mental capacity, intelligence or whatever. But she's got years and years of wisdom. You know, she's got prophetic words going way back further than, you know, before I was even talking to Jesus. And, you know, so she's got 
a, a history and a reservoir of things that she could speak out of that would actually be wisdom and truth and things God has literally spoken before. But she can't just say everything she knows in any given moment to us just because it was true once before. She listens to what Jesus is saying right now for that person, for that moment, because she loves him. And so that's what we have to do too. We have to keep our love for Jesus in the front. We have to keep the relationship with him is what is what is why we're following him. You know, I was thinking about the identity word and how in that that word about the tuberculosis and all of that, that our innocence and the simplicity of our integrity came from knowing what he says about us. And it occurred to me that I was just pondering on that more after we shared that word that I have to have reverence for God above my own opinion before that will even impact me. Because if I think that's what we say false humility is, uh, false humility is acting like you're, you're just lower than a worm because you feel lower than a worm. But God actually said you're a giant killer. You know, you're actually meant to take territory. And um, so if you won't listen to his word over your own mind or your own feelings, if you haven't exalted him above that. So he can tell you all day long that you're innocent. He can tell you who you are. But if you revere your opinion or other people's opinions above him, then it's just another opinion in the mix. It's just in the mix. They're swirling around and one of them may be at the at the top for one day, but then the other one will pop up the next day, you know. So there is an order to things. There is a reason. Um, so many things I, I heard Tisa um, saying today, like there had to be a payment for sin before we could receive his righteousness. God didn't just change the order of things. And so there is always an order of things. And um, having Jesus be in the lead always, always, always is of extreme importance. And so I felt it reminded me of this, this Psalm 85 that I've been on lately that just has been stirring me up on the inside. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful, um, beautiful scripture. And it basically it's, it's the, um, the sons of Korah's clan are singing or have wrote this song to him. And it's takes place in a time where the people have sort of been rescued from some sort of calamity. I didn't study it fully out, but I know it has to do with their return to Jerusalem. So maybe it may have been the Babylonians, or I'm not sure what captivity or what stage of things were, but they are like, whoo, you've restored Jacob's destiny from captivity. That much we know. So it's, it's a position of there in the process of being restored. And they're saying, you've forgiven our many sins and covered every one of them in your love. And th so we can relate to this because we are on that path of restoration ourselves. We're not, we haven't arrived fully, you know, we're on our way. And so um, I'm going to start with verse six. It says, revive us again, O God. I know you will give us a fresh start. And that's, you know, I, I say this all the time, but this journey is not just a linear process. It's it's you, you may be in one area have gone a little further than you have in another area. And so we're constantly living this out. We should constantly being, uh, experience his conviction. We should constantly need to repent from something because he's constantly showing us some new mindset or new perspective that we have that isn't in line with him. And if we kept following it, we wouldn't be following him anymore. So it's an ongoing process. So we should always say, be saying, revive us again, oh God. I know you will give us a fresh start. It goes on to say, then all your people will taste your joy and gladness even more, more than you. By you following Jesus, you make way for other people to experience his joy and gladness. Pour out even more of your love on us always asking for more. That's the theme of today too. We need more. We want you more. You know, I have to, I constantly have to even put him above when I see him starting to what it looks like maybe he's answering some prayers, providing something that my heart has cried out for. It's a good practice to even say, I want you more. I want you more than even the answer to my prayer. I want you Holy Spirit more. I want you, Papa, more. I want to know you as Father. I want to know you, Jesus, as my personal friend, my best friend, my lover. I want you more. I want that relationship with you more than having even my earthly desires satisfied. Then I want you more than feeling comfortable. I want you more than that. That keeps him in the lead. 
And our, it's, you know, there's a, I was listening to uh, this thing by Johnny Enlow just the other day. It just came back to me, but there, he was reminding um, the people who are listening that back in 2020, he prophesied that this was a, um, we were going into a season of abundance of the kingdom age and there would be abundance because there's a test of abundance and there's a test of lack. Will you remain faithful to him when you have, when you don't have enough? You know, will you, will you still love him? Will you still follow him when you don't have enough? And I think the Christian community is more used to that mindset. And he's saying, but he needs to know that when he's poured out everything that he has, that you'll still remain faithful to him because it's possible to choke on the blessing. It's possible to, to be thrown off by all the blessing that he pours out on you. So there's a test of even abundance that we are in in this season. And so it's a good practice every time, like I said, you start seeing what looks like he's steering things in a certain way that are maybe going to answer your prayers. Position yourself in that moment to say, I want you more. I want you more than even this thing being resolved for me. It's a very, very, very important thing that he's stressing right now that in all of these ways, we keep him first in our minds, in our hearts, in our lives. So it says, goes on to say, now I'll listen carefully for your voice and wait to hear whatever you say. Let me hear your promise of peace, the message every one of your godly lovers longs to hear. We want to continue to have a, a, a desire, a longing. You know, longing is good. You know, when you're in love with somebody and they have to go off on a trip and you're like, man, I can't wait for them to get back. Or you miss them. That's a good kind of missing. That's not a suffering kind of missing. That's a good kind of longing. I can't wait for them to get back. We want to stay in that position of, oh, tell me more. Tell me more of your promises. Every one of your godly lovers longs to hear it. That's a good position to be in. Don't let us in our ignorance turn back from following you. For I know your power and presence shines on all of your devoted lovers. Your glory always hovers over all who bow low before you. Just like we sang about today, we want his glory to pass before us, but we also want his glory to rest on us. Don't just pass by and keep going and then live your, and then have to live my life without your glory. We want his glory to rest on us, to stay with us, to be saturating our environment. The way we do that is to bow low. Every time he, he delivers a prophetic word, every time he speaks to you in a message and you know it's personal and it pings you and that person had no way of knowing, every time his, you experience his glory, it's a time to get low first and foremost. We can celebrate him from a position of surrender. We celebrate him from that position of bowing low before him. In verse 10, get this, this is just so beautiful to me. Your mercy and your truth have married each other. Your mercy and your truth have married each other. Your righteousness and peace have kissed. Now, what does that mean? What does that, what does that mean? And I read very quickly in the green room, I read a couple of um, footnotes other, other study Bibles talked about, but it speaks of a covenant relationship. Marriage is a covenant relationship. His mercy for us, there was a time when he had mercy for us, but he had to restrain himself, you know, before the sin offering was, was made. So his mercy and his truth have now married. He's entered into a covenant relationship with us. That's what's driving him. That's what is driving him in everything that he's doing. His righteousness and his peace have kissed. One of the footnotes I read said that, all of this is in perfect harmony within him. Mercy and truth are perfectly blended in perfect tandem operation within him. Righteousness and peace are in the perfect position to give you a kiss. Okay. It's in the perfect position. You know, when we do things on our own, we are constantly having to adjust. Well, how much do I do this? You know, well, how much do I you know, how much do I do this? Or maybe I shouldn't do that. And, you know, I had an example of that this week. I had a little thing going on and I thought a little with my health and I thought I need to um, drink some vinegar because I've heard about all the benefits of vinegar, right? 
well, I went way overboard. I, I was like three times a day. I drank like a whole bottle, basically, of vinegar in a few days. And then I had basically created another problem for myself. That's what we do. That's, that's exactly what we do. Thank, thankfully, I had an appointment at the doctor already, and they were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Because I, I had gone and bought me another bottle, a bigger bottle. I was going all in, all in. And I was creating another problem for myself. And that's what we do in our humanity. Even with all the good teaching and wisdom, we swing the pendulum really far. But Jesus is the one with everything is in perfect balance within him. It's in perfect harmony. Even the good stuff. You understand? We, we get that we need to get the bad stuff out. But we take the good stuff and we overdo it. Vinegar is does have health benefits. But you shouldn't drink it all day long. Okay? <laughs> There is such a thing as too much. And we do that. We don't have that mixture right. We can't use our own judgment. His covenant, his devotion to us. Do you understand Jesus is our high priest? 100% fully committed to developing you into the resurrected Jesus. He knows all the balances. He knows when to tweak a little this way, a little tweak a little way that way. That's why we have to have him in the lead. Flowers of your faithfulness are blooming on the earth. Isn't that beautiful? Have you ever tried to grow flowers? Have you ever tried to just keep them alive? Start a garden. There's a little bit of that, you know, too much water, not enough water. Too much acid in the soil, too much base in the soil. I mean, there's a balance to all that. Those flowers don't bloom unless there's perfect conditions for them to be in their perfect design. His faithfulness is what causes you to bloom on earth. It's his faithfulness. We talk about him being the night gardener. He's the daytime gardener too. He's the gardener all day long, tending the garden of our hearts. Don't fire the gardener because you think you know better. Okay. We've got to keep the gardener in charge of the garden. Righteousness shines down from the sky. Yes, the Lord keeps raining down blessing after blessing and prosperity will drench the land with a bountiful harvest. That's a beautiful promise right there. This final verse just has been so powerful to me. It says in the Passion Translation, for deliverance goes before him, preparing a path for his steps. So it sounds like we're talking about Jesus and it says deliverance goes before Jesus, preparing a path for Jesus. So that's kind of had me thinking. In the Amplified, it says righteousness will go before him and will make his footsteps into a way. A way. In the voice, it says justice will come before him, marking out a path, setting a way for his feet. There, It is a principle of God that something goes before you. Something even came before Jesus. The heart of God came before Jesus, before Jesus came and walked on the earth. Do you understand? There's always something going out ahead of you. It's not just Jesus literally. I mean, you know, we, we have that little catchphrase that, you know, Jesus goes before me, goes before me and behind me. That's great. But no, you have to understand there is an entire movement, a supernatural thing happening out ahead of you. I, I even heard, if you listen to that Rabbi Brian, I think it was, that Tisa shared a clip for, I listened to that whole thing, and he talked, happened to mention how in the Holy of Holies, before they went into the Holy of Holies, they had to put some incense in there. They just swung it underneath the, the curtain to get that incense in there, to get the incense and go to go ahead of them before they went in. So there's always this principle. That there's something going out ahead of you. Deliverance is going before you. Just think about the supernatural act of deliverance is going out ahead of you in your current circumstances. Wherever you're at with the word of the year, with the things that have been shared today and in previous messages, deliverance is going out ahead of you in that thing. His righteousness, righteousness is going out ahead of you. Just think of it as a mist even. I like to think about it. I like to make it natural. You know, like it's that that little incense. Is, you swing it out there, swing it out there ahead of you. His righteousness is going out ahead of you in all that you do. Don't You don't want to get out of that path. 
You don't want to step out on your own and go fishing again because there's no incense of righteousness going out ahead of you. There's no incense of deliverance going out ahead of you. Now, the voice says justice will come before him. And one of the things that one of the little footnotes I read um, pointed to the fact that this psalm was written when the people are on their way back to Jerusalem. There was an injustice that took place that take, took them away from their calling. There was an injustice that took place in almost every person's life that took you away from their, your calling. There was an injustice that led the way to me getting stumbled up and tripped up and creating a hard heart and all of these things to, you know, Tisa shared in her own life. She could have, have gotten a hard heart against the prophetic in that moment. You know, there was an injustice that she saw happening and she could, that could have led her away, but for the righteousness of God, but for the justice of Jesus that led the way into her actual purpose. So justice was leading the Israelites way back to Jerusalem to where they were supposed to be. And justice is going out ahead of us. So those things in your life that have happened that feel unjust, they're currently unjust. You know they're not right. Justice itself, okay, the spirit of justice is going out ahead of you in that circumstance. And so you want to stay with him. Just stay the course in your relationship with him, making the love of Jesus in that relationship with him be first and foremost. He said it very specifically to me in a dream. Don't do step two if you're not doing step one. You you can't, and, and that word, I think it said that you have to revere the seed giver before you enjoy the fruit. And you know, that seed, we talk about it all the time, a seed has to go into the ground and die. You cover it up with dirt. You can't even see anything. In fact, it would look like you're throwing, you know, compost on top of it. Like you're, you're almost having to let it go. Like say, okay, well, I could guard this in my hands, but it's not going to grow there. You have to put it into the ground and be out of reverence for the designer, out of reverence for the one who made the seed, who made the system, who made the flowers bloomed in the first place without being able to see it, touch it or impact it. You have to trust and have reverence for the seed giver before you can enjoy the fruit that will eventually grow from it. So Papa, we just say we hear you today. We thank you for your message. We thank you for your teaching today. We thank you for your ministry to us today. Holy Spirit, we have reverence for your words. We have so much reverence that sometimes we can run out ahead of you. And we just repent for that right now. We just turn from that and we say we're sorry for doing that. And we didn't mean to. We were excited. We were very exuberant. And we got out ahead of ourselves. But but we want to stay in relationship with you first and foremost because of all that you are. And I thank you that the more we look at you, the more we realize why we need to keep our eyes fixed on you, why we need to have our gaze fixed on you, and that we won't look away. We won't look away because you have our gaze. So I thank you for the way you've just been speaking. I even realize now through the whole service, even in worship, you've been trying to call us back to you in every way. So I thank you, Holy Spirit, for the way that you you teach us and you remind us. You search our hearts and you search the heart of the Father for all the ways that we aren't seeing correctly. And you just whisper it to us. You whisper it to us. And we have the privilege of getting to hear you. We have the privilege of our hearts already being softened enough to hear you and to receive that teaching. So I just say that we will be humble. We will be humble lovers of Jesus today. And we will get back in our right position. We will get back in our right position. And we will cry out that we want you more than even our own healing, than even our own restoration. I would rather stay just as I am today in an unhealed state in certain areas than to not have you in first and foremost in my life. So we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Holy Spirit. We thank you, Papa. Make this a personal message for people today, Holy Spirit. Make it personal. Do what you're doing for us in this room, for even the people that are hearing this message who aren't here today, or the people that we meet and the people that we come across, or the topics in our lives that we haven't thought of yet applying this to. Make it personal for us. Make it personal for them. We want to know and to be to hear your words and be changed by them. So we thank you, Papa. We love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. We'll say it till the end of our days and then forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's welcome Cheryl to take up offering.
so good. He said it was a significant day. Wow, I love that. I think, you know, we can just make our lives really simple and ask that question from Jesus, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. And I think, you know, it's really cool because my love language is gifts. So I feel like I get this. But like when you give somebody a gift, it is the best feeling, especially when it is something from his heart. And so the act of giving does that. We actually get to experience the pleasure that Jesus has over people when we practice the act of giving. And so it's something that actually transforms and softens our own heart and frees us from having to be on our own minds all the time. That is such a prison to always have to be worrying about, am I good? And giving actually breaks us out of that to where we can see people and we can trust him with what he's going to provide for us. So we've got a couple ways you can practice giving today. We've got our box back there. If you want to put cash or checks in an envelope, notate on the envelope how you want to give. If you want to give electronically, we've got that QR code on the screen. You can scan that right now. Um, type in the little address on your phone as well, and it will bring it to where you can put your card information and a little drop down there to give. If you want to give after service, we've got it posted up over there underneath our calendars. And then if you feel like giving on a day that isn't named Wednesday or Sunday, just be sure to be signed up for our Evernote page um, because we have our links to everything on there um, and Halo's on there as well. So let's stand and do our tithe declaration. Papa God, thank you for being my provider. Thank you for being my sustainer. I lack nothing while I live under the canopy of El Shaddai. I bring my tithe freely today. I bring my offering freely today. I bring them both with joy because you said you love a cheerful giver. I delight in giving as you delight in giving to me. I give these offerings to you. I give these offerings to demonstrate my love for how well you care for me. I yield my life to your direction, instruction, and function. I yield today to bring about your yield in my life. Thank you for caring for me. Freely I have received. Freely I give today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Papa, I just thank you for all the places that you have blessed us to be a blessing. So I bless the tithe and offering today in Jesus' name. Amen.